former Defensive Player of the Year, All Pro. You get it, Goat Charles Woodson. Yeah. What's up, guys? Hey, man. Good to be on the show, man. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. I look over your shoulder. I see the tuck rule literally very yeah. prominent. And I saw the Tom Brady piece in the NFL icons. That was a bunch of bullshit, Charles, wasn't it? Just a bunch of bullshit out there. Hey, a bullshit times 10. That's why I got this right. Hey, I'm in my I'm in my son's room right now, so this is just a constant reminder to him, man, that his, that his daddy got screwed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter what happens in life, man. You just got to keep on going. Hey, still won a Super Bowl, which is good. Still have a ring at the end of the day, so they'll always call you a world champion, as they should with how you played. I want to kind of dive into this, because you're obviously a legend at the Raiders and a legend at the Packers. And we asked A.J. Hawk, who was, uh, got very fortunate to play alongside to you is how he described it. We said, why was Charles Woodson so good? He said you were the smartest football player he's ever played on a field with. Was it always like that when you grew up in Fremont, Ohio? Did it develop at Michigan? When did you become the guy you think where your teammates say, that football IQ is better than any human I've ever shared the field with? Man, I would love to say that it's always been that way, but I think, uh, you know, just as a, as a young athlete, man, I was, I was just very athletic, man. I had some God-given stuff, man, that was given to me and so I could either, you know, outrun everybody, out quick everybody. Um, and then just over time, man, you know how it is, man, this experience. You know, you go through all of the experiences of the game. You gain the knowledge of it. You learn how to uh, study an opponent. You learn how to um, break down the opponent's, you know, offense. You understand who's out there in terms of personnel. You start g gaining all this knowledge of situational football, and then you apply it to the field. And so I was able to uh, to do that. I was able to, uh, what I call, have great play recall. You know what I mean? So if I saw something, you know, I could apply it to the next play or from the first half to the second half or just bring it from the film room to the field. I was always able to do that, man. So I think just over time, man, and, and, and the experience of the game and being out there and playing so much football, you become better and become better at recognizing what's happening to you. Yeah, the ability to recall it, I think, is what would separate you being the smartest player somebody's ever played with than just being another player, you know, being able to realize what's probably going to happen and act upon it before everybody else showcases you got a big ass brain. Okay, you got a big ass brain. What was yeah. your major? What was your major in Michigan? Football. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's why my brain is so big when it comes to the game, man. That's what I majored in, man. I majored in it, uh, you know, undergrad, post-grad, post uh, my, my, my master's, my doctorate. Football, baby. Well, Dr. Charles, I'm pumped that you uh, are having an right. NFL icons on Saturday <laughs> night at 10 p.m. Have you been paying attention to this Michigan stuff? It's crazy, Charles. It's crazy. Yeah, it's kind of hard not to. You know, um, you know I'm – Three years at the University of Michigan. I was a fan before I went there. I, I played there, of course. I'm a fan now. And, uh, you know, it's to me, I, I look at the situation and, and I just really have to say, first of all, it's great to be a Michigan Wolverine. Um, two, I got to congratulate Jim Harbaugh for building this team into a position where it seems like people are envious of what he has going on in this program. If you think about it, man, five, six years ago, did nobody care about what Michigan was doing. Um, you know, Harbaugh was a couple of years in. Uh, you know, we were winning some games, but we, we couldn't beat Ohio State. And now here we are. We've been able to beat those guys two times in a year, uh, two times in a row. And so now uh, everybody's looking at Michigan and saying, okay, you know, these guys can't be that good. What are they doing wrong? Yeah, that's the way I look at it, man. And so uh, just congratulations to Michigan for building the program up, uh, getting the type of recruits in there. Uh, that, like I said, people are looking at and saying, wow, you know, where did this come from? And saying they must be cheaters if they're this good. So I'm proud today to be a Michigan Wolverine and have everybody looking at us as a team to beat. I love it. I love it so much. Desmond Howard, same exact type, you know, as it was all kind of developing over the last few weeks. And at the beginning, it was all like so muddled. And it is still, I think, until we see some actual evidence, I don't think any of us are going to fully comprehend what's going on. But all the stuff that's been alleged and alluded to is like so absurd. Desmond, through the whole thing, was like, what are we talking about? Yeah. What are we talking about? What, what are we talking about? What, 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 the, the thing is, everything that I hear on, on every outlet is that everybody steals. But it seems like when it comes to Michigan, they're saying, oh, Michigan is stealing, stealing. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Well, it's uh, you, because you of that team over your shoulder, I think. I think it's because one of those teams over your shoulder there with uh, Spygate, how 
that thing became yeah. <laughs> like, well, they were filming and recording, yep. which is different than what everybody else was doing. So there's a little bit of like a precedent yeah. in the football world of what is good and what is not yeah. good. But then it's like, did Harbaugh have any idea that it was happening? Was this guy – like there's just so many question marks about it all. It really is. And this team's good this year. Yeah. This, the team is no, the, the, great this year. The, the, the team is a great thing. But, you know, in terms of me saying, you know, that everyone is coming on saying that, you know, every team steals. Um, you get these Big Ten coaches together. They have a Zoom call, and, and the focus is Michigan and what they've done wrong. It's almost as if everyone's got together and said, hey, the Michigan Wolverines, they were in the bank. They held the guns. They had the ski mask. Hey, we were just the drivers. We were outside, you know, so we didn't we didn't terrorize anybody. We didn't put the gun to anybody's head. We were just the getaway car. No, 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 man. Everybody's going to jail. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it don't matter what part you played in it. If you're stealing, you're stealing. And so that means if we're going to have some type of sanctions put on, you know, Harbaugh, then there's got to be some sanctions on other uh, coaches as well. And does, does Harbaugh get more because he was more a part of the plot? Maybe so. But everybody, uh, you know, everybody's hands are, are dirty in this situation. That was one part of the 10-page letter response that Michigan sent back. That was basically like, if we want to open this can of worms, how did, how did it, what did it basically say there, Pete? Uh, yeah, basically they said, hey, listen, the conference needs to be very, very careful with setting precedent here because if they open this can of worms, uh, there's going to be a lot of schools that are going to be you know, coming under the crosshairs here. Yeah, it's crazy because Pete Thamel has yeah. been reporting what he's been hearing, and then the AP gets news, and then the rest of the Big Ten that we asked some other college coaches were like, what are your thoughts on it? They're like, well, the, the, the signals are like, let's, uh, but we need headphones. We need speakers in the helmet. And it's like the NCAA is like, you got it. We'll do that playoffs going forward. So hopefully this will be something that we never have to talk about ever again, but allegedly a ruling's coming. Let's go back to the NFL. It feels like defenses are having a better year this year than they had in the past. I think scoring's down. I think offenses are looking less efficient than they had in the past with the transition of the new rules pretty much that kind of put defense at a hindrance on every single play. Did you see the evolution of football as something that made defense much harder? And why do you think defenses are maybe playing better now than they had ever in years past? Well, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the defense playing a little bit better, it's because now – you know, they're, they're seeing, you know, what offenses are doing You know, now for the past few years. Uh, what offenses are doing is they're getting their playmakers on the field. You know, there was a time when you didn't have as many, you know, wide receivers on the field at one time as many times as you do now during the game. I mean, teams are coming out now as three wide receivers, four wide receivers. You know, back when, you know, I first came in the, in the league, you know, we played, you know, it was 21 personnel. And then on third down, maybe you put 11 person personnel in there. So now we're just kind of getting used to seeing it. And those guys are, are getting a better look at the concepts, you know, that you get out of having so many, you know, wide receivers on the field. Uh, but the game has definitely, you know, transitioned over time. You know, uh, looking at the receivers, man, and looking at all of the yards that, that, that they put up. Of course, we've had great receivers over the years. But I think when you watch receivers and in, in the way in which they go across the middle of the field, you know, it's like the confidence that they run across that field, man, and knowing – that that linebacker under five yards can't just take his head off before the ball comes, man. They just run across there so freely. And I think that's the way the game has headed. You know, this it's an offensive league. They want to see points on the board. They want to see guys throw the ball up and down the field. And so they they like to tie their hands behind, you know, the defensive backs. backs. Like I, I watched um, Stephen Gilmore get a, a pass interference the other night against Philly. And he's he's in front of the receiver, you know, this little hand-to-hand -hand combat, and, and, they, and the, the referees threw the flag, and it's like, dude, he had great position on the wide receiver. He, he he's, His footwork was impeccable, and he still gets the flag. You know, you get past five yards, and all, all of a sudden they say the defensive back can't touch the receiver, but that receiver can push off of you. He can tug your jersey and do all of these certain things. But as soon as you touch that guy, it's not you know, fair, these flags Charles. come out so – it's not now, fair. It, it, it's definitely, definitely not fair. Yeah. And so, you know, that's 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 the that's the problem, you know, for us guys. And then, of course, the, the the quarterbacks. Come on, man. You know, these guys eventually, the quarterbacks, I think, will have two flags on, and you know, you have to get one of those flags off. You can't touch them, can't tackle them, can't throw them down to the ground. You know, so that that part of the game, man, to me, is ridiculous. I think roughing the passer definitely needs to be a reviewable play, buddy. I mean. 
we can we can start reviewing the reviews too. Like there, there's uh -huh. levels to this thing. Like make it reviewable, and then I, also I, let's figure I, out the I, review I, system too. You know. Hey, so hey, sometimes, man, you should just review it and then just go to somebody in the stands and say, hey, what are you see? Just, just, give me, give me another, just give me another pair of eyes on this thing, man, because I, I think you're right, because sometimes we see these reviews and we can clearly see yes. what, what, what the call should be. And then the referee comes back on the field and, and says the opposite. And we're like, what? What, 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 are, you, what are you looking at? You know, the, the review is there to get the call right. Charles, the world is so divided, seemingly, especially on the internet with everything, yeah. literally yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. And then there'll be something yeah. that brings the entire world together. Oh, that's definitely not. Like everybody on the internet. Right. And then a ref will come in and say, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just like, how are you seeing it so differently? And then they give us a glimpse into the review room and it's just like <laughs> three dipshits staring at like a computer. It's like, how, why is my setup at my house? better than what the NFL is using to review this entire thing. We need to review the reviews, but whenever you're talking yeah. about the quarterback pass interference and Stephon Gilmore, did he get fined for that pass interference? They're fining everybody right now, Charles. I don't know if you've seen this. We're talking like thirty, fifty, hundred thousand dollar fines uh -oh. for standard football plays. Charles, standard football yeah, plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think he would get uh fined for the pass interference, but I think anytime it's a hands to the face or face mask or something like that. Uh, you you do get that letter, and I, and I think man, the league man, they they need to make the fines relative to what a guy gets paid. Like you can't, everybody can't just get fined forty eight thousand dollars, man. That that is ridiculous. So, uh, depending on you know what a player makes, man, you got to scale it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't just. Come on, man. Guy making a league minimum, you can't be finding them, you know, forty eight, fifty thousand dollars. That's crazy. Hey, you're paying us thirteen grand this week yeah. to play. Yeah. You get to be here. Yes, sir. You yeah. get to be here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Tone exactly. has a question for you, Charles. Yeah, I, yeah Charles. Um yeah. I was looking at I saw uh, earlier this week, uh, you had your defensive MVP uh, that you were giving out, and I believe it was three edge guys with the winner going to Max Crosby. And and I think since you and then Troy won it. Only Steph Gilmore has been the only other guy to not be a D lineman or edge guy to win the defensive MVP. Do you think it's just an edge D line award now, or do you just have to be incredibly special to win defensive MVP if you're in the secondary these days? Yeah, it's kind of hard to do. I mean, yeah, there's been a couple of myself, uh, Steph in, you know, Dion was a guy who won it. Uh, I think Bob Sanders won it mm -hmm. uh, with Indianapolis, I believe, you know, so, you know, there's been a few of us, but, you know, it, it's one of those things. It's kind of like um, uh, it's kind of like the quarterback position, like the quarterback. You know, in terms of offensive um, MVP or uh, MVP, it's all about those numbers. You know, um, and, and so on the defensive side, you know, the sack guys, you know, they get 18, 19, 20 sacks. You know, that's a that's a huge number. So that's what people uh, look at. And you know, those, those guys are definitely disruptive. You know, our game is built on you know being able to get to the quarterback. So there's a lot of attention put on those edge rush guys and those guys that can get into the backfield and disrupt. So they get that attention. Those guys, you know, back there sometimes we don't get to put up those numbers. You know, if you're one of the best, a lot of times, you know, you're not getting a lot of action. They don't talk about you a, a whole lot. So it's harder to win it. But every now and then we put up one of those years, man, with the defensive backs. We look pretty good doing what we do, baby. Hey, Trevon Diggs, uh, just a couple years ago, he had like 11 picks yep. going into like week 15. Yeah. It was like, wait a minute. Is this guy, yeah. and then, you know, it goes the other way. But Hey, with the way offenses are right now, like with all this shit, D lineman, <laughs> you know what I mean? D lineman can just blow that up. Yeah. yeah. You get a good D, like Chris Jones, yeah. obviously, mm -hmm. Aaron Donald, the list goes on and on. You get one of those big guys in the middle, they can ruin an entire offense like every single week, week yeah. after week. Because DBs, you guys got to rely upon ball getting out too to get there, you know? Yeah, you're, you're relying on opportunities. And there's so many, you know, different places a quarterback can put the ball, you know, and they're looking at matchups. You know, they're throwing the ball at the best matchup and, and trying to, you know, uh, for their offense, move the chains, you know, get first downs and that sort of thing. But when you think about guys like Aaron Donald, who you mentioned, who to me I think should have been an MVP of the entire league and, and not just defensive player of the year, to do what he did from the interior line you know, for for so many years, the dominance in which he played at, like I can I can see why he wins it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that that it's evident that he was the best player on the field every time, regardless of being defense, quarterback, or whatever it is, he was the best guy on the field. And I think he's a guy that they miss out on as being 
uh, uh, an NFL MVP and not just a defensive player of the year. So all the old school quarterbacks talk about how the game's getting easier because mm-hmm. there's only a read off of a player as opposed to an entire defense. Who are some of the quarter uh, the quarterbacks that are obviously remembered from your era? Peyton and Tom, and then I guess Ben Rolfesberger will be in there a little yeah. bit. Phil Rivers obviously had a hell of a run Flacco. during. Joe Flacco won himself a $100 million contract whenever he's on his final year of his contract and wins the Super Bowl. But whenever you talk about those guys at the top, what made them different? And is there any stories from when you were playing one of those guys where it was a good mental joust taking place throughout all four quarters? Yeah, I think, you know, all of the guys you mentioned, you know, are, are great players. Um, Hall of Famers, you know, when you think about what made those guys special, um, you know, we talked earlier earlier about, you know, the way you see the game, you know, and that mental aspect. And I think with all of those guys, it was, you know, their ability to, you know, break that huddle, um, scan that defense and kind of know what was about to happen, what you were in as a defense, you know, where that pressure was coming from. Uh, again, understanding the matchups and, and, and always seemingly being able to make the right throw, you know, that's what made those guys uh, the best. And I think in terms of, you know, those chess matchups, you know, playing against, you know, Peyton Manning, uh, you know, when I was, uh, you know, a player who was moving around, playing outside, playing nickel and those different things and being able to, you know, line up in the slot and move around and watch Peyton and watch his eyes and see how he scanned the defense and me trying to stand, you know, in a way that he doesn't think I'm coming. (laughs) Uh, whether, but I'm actually coming or, you know, vice versa. You know, those are, those, those are the great games that, that you're able to play with one of those guys because you know if you give them the tip, it's a wrap. You know, and there's it, it, going to be no question about it. You get the tip. They get the tip, it's over. You know, it's going to be either a touchdown, it's going to be a big play, uh, or they're going to get the ball to the running back and, 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 you know, run to the, you know, give him the ball so he can run to the open space. So those guys were tough, man. It was always great you know, going up against them guys and, like you said, trying to play that little chess match with them. Peyton was looking for, hey, this guy's left foot is six inches. You see that? <laughs> it's even with his heel. Yeah. You see that? You see that? It's even yeah, with, yeah. on film. He's watching on film. Yeah. Give me another one. I need another third and seven with this guy sitting on it. Yup, his left foot, yeah. when it's even with his heel. Am I going to be able to see that? Uh, yeah, I'll be able to see that. And then it's like, boom. Yep. That's all he needed. You said mm-hmm. just the two. It's like, Literally, he finds one thing, and it, now it's his job to let you know, not let you know that he knows that as well. It's crazy, the level of shit that's happening exactly. out there. No, exactly. I mean, we're, we're looking at quarterbacks. We're looking at, you know, how they stand. You know what I'm saying? If, if their, their feet are even, you know, it's a good chance they're going to hand, hand that ball off. If one foot is back, then they're trying to get out of there, get to their three-step, get to their five-step, or whatever it is. Um, or if they're under center and, and, and the feet are even, then they're probably going to throw the ball to the left. You know, so there's, you know, a lot of different things that you're that you're checking out, um, you know, that, that that you're trying to get a key on. And, you know, when you get into a game and you start seeing these certain things and, and they start happening the way you see it, that's when you that's when you get your jump. So, yeah, the game, ain't, it ain't just about putting the pads on, putting the helmet out and, and running around and, and, and making tackles or, you know, trying to get off blocks. No, no, no. We, we you know, the guys who. Uh, you know, from my my position, who have over fifty interceptions, we ain't just out there just playing football, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're out there trying to get an edge, and, and we're watching every little thing. Where that split is at, you know, who, who's in the game? Is it is it a stack? Oh. You know, is it? Yeah, you know, are you, do you have you know guys lined up or, or lined up on each side of the formation? You know, are they both on the numbers? You know, it's it's a lot of stuff you're looking at, man. Where it's like, hey. You know, if I see this and you throw it, I'm out of there. I'm gone. And I am I am taking it to the paint as well. And all that's a lot. That's awesome, by the way. (laughs) I don't want the ball. I'm gonna leave it here. This is as long as I need it. I get an inch into the end zone. But all those uh you're talking about these guys, you know, from my perspective with 50 picks and stuff, it's like all gold jackets too. So it's like the the brains I don't think ever get talked about enough. Not only brains though, got to be a damn dog out there. Speaking of, Connor has a question for you. Yeah, Charles, you're probably the perfect person to ask this, but there's been a lot of talk over the, you know, past few weeks, especially with the Raiders about, you know, what it means to be a Raider. I think Max Crosby Mm -hmm. said on his podcast, The Rush, uh, you know, like I felt like I was born to be a Raider because they are kind of the outlaws of the NFL, if you will. But from your perspective, what does it really mean to be a Raider? And does it involve drinking tequila with uh, Mark Davis in his suite? Or whiskey. Why? 
Hey, yeah, a little little Woodson bourbon whiskey, a little cigar. <laughs> you know, that that's that, that's what it means, man. And I, I man, when when you watch those guys after the game and you know the joy that they had after after you know winning um the game at home, you know, in front of their home crowd, and then you know, after the game, the the, the cigars and, and all of that stuff, man, that was just kind of to me, it, it was a little bit of an old school feeling. And I think Max mentioned it, you know, when he, you know, was able to talk to George Atkinson and some of the guys who are around, you know, that organization who played back in those days. Um, I had those same conversations with George and, and Willie Brown um, and, and, and Cliff, Cliff Branch, you know, and, and all of those, those old school guys that, and, and I see Howie every week, you know, you know, and, and, and a lot of times we're in despair, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. on our, uh, on, on our days at work when we're looking at the Raiders, but it was just a tough, hard nosed kind of um, outlaw feeling that you get when you're a Raiders. And Willie Brown used to always tell us, man, when I first met Willie Brown, he said, Hey, there's 31 teams in the NFL. And then there are the Raiders. And that's the way we went into it thinking each and every year. And I think Max uh, definitely feels that way. Um, he feels like he sort of, you know, fits that mold, you know, a as a Raider, as, as a guy that not other people want, uh, many people didn't want. You know, he's got the tattoos. And like I said, you saw him smoking the cigar in the locker room. Like, that's, that's Raiders, man. But what the Raiders were, they were winners as well. And so, you know, we want to get back to, you know, being those tough Raiders, but also winning, you know, getting to Super Bowls. You know, this is a Super Bowl winning organization and we got to get back to that. Not just the attitude, but the winning to go along with it. Yeah, it feels like they're one and oh. Hey, yep. one and oh yep. since uh Antonio. One and oh. That's all we can ask. Hey, baby. only one coach, and only coach that has stud earrings too. So uh <laughs> count me in with Antonio <laughs> Pierce. Uh we appreciate you so much. Saturday night. 10 p.m. MGM Plus. We can't wait for the world to see more about your story. And shout out to you doing so much work with that children's hospital. The lady on the thing that I saw yeah. said like $73 million he's helped raise for that. You're helping the world, Charles. Hell yeah. You're helping the world. Man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. CS Mott Children's Hospital, University of Michigan. We have the Charles Woodson Fund. Uh, we've raised, like you said, counsels, countless amounts of money for that hospital to get it built, to maintain it. And to be able to treat young young families, really, not just the children, but families as a whole, because everybody goes through it together. So I appreciate the shout out on that. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you doing it. Also, the whiskey. Why? Hey, let's keep it going. You're the man. Hey, 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 hey. The official bourbon of the Las Vegas Raiders, baby. What's let's the go. name? Woodson Bourbon Whiskey. Oh, so it, so it's a bourbon. What's that mean? What's a, it means? It's oh, it's bourbon. That that means it's made here. It's made here. Uh, to be a bourbon, it's just got to be made here in the states, but. It does come from Kentucky. It has to be 100% uh, new oak. Oh. Um, it has to be 51% corn, baby. That's oh. what makes it. Wow. <laughs> hey, we appreciate the hell out of you. You're the man, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Woods. Yeah.